Well, hello there. Uh, back again, Chapter 1, Lesson B on functions. Objectives are listed below. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, basically working with functions today. Talking a little bit of domain and range and function notation. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first I'd like to get started with the idea of a relation as opposed to a function. Uh, a relation, by definition, is is items or quantities that are related to each other. So let's say we have a set A and another set B. And the set A is considered the independent variable, the set B the dependent variable. Therefore, uh, all the values within A, whatever they might be, map to these other values in B. Right? whatever they might be, maybe two of them go to the same one, or one of them goes to two different values, right? It doesn't really matter. This is a relation, or short for relationship, right? Items from one set are related to the other set. Now a relation, it doesn't matter how many times this point in the input set A goes to a different value. So it could go to 10 different values and still be a relation, okay? But in a function, the input values in A can go to one and only one value in B. So this four right here would be a violation of what we consider a function to be. All right, so the definition of a function is a relation between two sets A and B such that every element of A, which is considered the input or independent variable, assigns to only one element of B, the dependent variable or output. Therefore, uh, I don't know why I went to blue. Oh, it's because of earlier. Gosh darn it. One, let's say it maps to 10 and two maps to 15, and three goes to negative five, and four goes to negative five. This is allowed, both three and four can go to negative five, can uh, produce an output of negative five. But no one input can have two separate outputs. That's a violation of what's called a function. Okay, let's get started with some of our other stuff. Next slide here. So let's classify the three following uh, examples as either a relation, non-function, or a function. All right, so let's look at the first one. As I look at the first one, I see 0 maps to 4, 3 to 7, negative 2 to 0, 0 to negative 11, 1 to 8, and 5 to 13. I notice in this case that 0 will produce both 4 and negative 11. Therefore, this is not a function not a function. Now if I were to take one of those out, if this wasn't here, then it would be a function. Okay. Uh, in the second example, uh, I follow this volume function as a, a with respect to time, and it looks like it does this little loop here. Um, notice that visually, let's say that this is uh, time t equals 2. Notice that at time t equals 2, the volume could take on three separate, uh, three separate values. Therefore, this would not be a function either. Can't instantaneously take on more than one value. Could I sketch a volume function that would be a function, would not have this issue? Sure, here's a volume function that would not have that issue. Awesome. Okay, algebraically, so we've looked at a tabular or a table. We've looked at graphically. Let's look at a, uh, an, an equation for a relation. Okay, so as I look at this, I see that I want to get y alone. So I would take x, bring it over to the uh, opposite side, and then I would have to take the square root. And as you know, with the square root, what that does is that produces for us positive and negative value. What that tells me is that I'm going to have two outputs. Two outputs for every x. 
except for, uh, well, no, actually every X. Uh, actually not, except for 17, but that's irrelevant at this point um, for at least one X. Let's say that, at least one X in the domain of this function. Okay, so for example, if I plug in one, I get y equals plus or minus the square root of 16. Well, that's two possible values. So uh, if I plug in a one, I get four. And if I plug in a one, I get negative four. And that's, again, a violation of the definition of a function. Okay, let's go to the next slide and keep seeing what we get here. So this slide we won't spend a whole lot of time on. I just want to talk about function notation. Um, this is not written in function notation, as you, you might recognize this as the area of a circle. Uh, this would be function notation if I were to write it with the independent variable nested on that left side. Okay, so other formulas that we're aware of, circumference equals 2 pi r. Okay, well, function notation for that would be circumference with respect to r is 2 pi r. Or, for example, um, other functions that uh, you might be aware of. Uh, let's see. For example, y equals mx plus b, where m and b are constants. We typically, to put it in function notation, give it, assign it a name. We'll call this one f of x. It would be mx plus b. Okay, this notation right here is not a times r and c times r and f times x. That's a of r, c of r, and f of x. Okay, that's the way we say that. Let's use that on our next slide. Okay, so here we have g of x written in function notation, and I want to know the output, or what value is assigned to 1 when 1 is the input of g of x. What is its output? Well, in order to find g of 1, I'm going to go ahead and plug in a 1 everywhere that I see an x. It looks like I get 1 minus 9, so g of 1 is equal to negative 8. Now, g of a, interesting, I'm not asking you, in this case, for a simplified answer like I did in part 1. What I'm looking for is a generalized answer. So it looks like uh, if a is a constant, then g of a will be a squared minus 9a. Okay, that follows very closely to the actual rule for this function. All right, I'm just plugging in an a there. Okay, so what would g of x minus g of a equal? Well, g of x is x squared minus 9x, and g of a is a squared minus 9a. We could leave it like that. We could simplify it, but uh, I think for now that's pretty good. Okay, so g of x plus h. This is an interesting one. What we're going to do is our input is x plus h. So everywhere you see an x, you're going to insert x plus h. Let me say that one more time to make this clear. Our input is x plus h. So I'm going to plug an x plus h in in both x values or any x value that I see within the function. So think of the function as a shell, right? And it looks like this. It's 9 excuse me, it's something squared minus 9 somethings. And that something in this case is x plus h. Now, what I would have you do here is simplify. And I'm going to go ahead and do that using, in this first term, the FOIL method, or double distribute, as some may call it. That will be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And in the second term, I'm going to distribute a negative 9. So I'm going to leave the negative out here, and I'm going to put 9x plus 9h. And I would ask that you, again, simplify if you can. Uh, I'm going to do uh, that by going ahead and just writing this as uh, x squared uh, plus 2xh uh, minus 9x plus h squared plus 9h. Now... The order in which you write that is not necessarily important. It's just that you see you're trying to combine like terms where possible and use correct algebra along the way. Okay, let's keep moving. Some functions, as we've seen before, and you likely seen in the past, are 
uh, put together in pieces. Therefore, different parts of the real number line, or domain as it's called, uh, produce different functions. So for example, the one below here, h of t, takes on two different function values depending on its input value. So if t, the independent variable, is less than zero, h of t equals t squared plus one. If t is greater than or equal to zero, then h of t equals 2t plus 1, okay? Closely related, but not the same. So if I want to know what h of negative 4 is, well, negative 4 lands in the interval where t is less than 0. Therefore, I'm going to plug negative 4 into that part of the piecewise function. So h of negative 4 would equal 16 plus 1, which is 17. Okay, h of 0. Well, where does 0 fall? Does 0 fall in the first or the second interval? Notice that you've got a greater than or equal to here. Therefore, h of 0 will be utilized and inputted into the second part of the piecewise function. So we're going to take 2 times 0 and add 1. Therefore, h of 0 is equal to 1. Okay, 11 likewise falls within that second interval, therefore h of 11 would be 2 times 11 plus 1. So h of 11 would equal 23. Okay, let's keep on moving. Okay, now we're going to get into domain. Now domain is uh, defined as uh, the set of all real numbers for which the expression uh, is defined. Okay, we're going to talk deeper about that in just a minute. An expression's domain can be described explicitly, meaning that it's given to you. So it might say, here is this function, and here is its domain. In other cases, the expression's domain can be implied, meaning that it must be found using the expression or a graph given. The range of a function is the set of all outputs that are a result of evaluating the expression across its domain, just all possible outputs. Right? And we can see that based on its graph, or in this case, we'll look at a couple of examples. It says find the domain, which is implied, and range for each function, inequality, and interval notation. Um, we're going to just, in this case, we're going to use mostly uh, interval notation, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Okay, we're going to use this notation right here. Okay, let's look at this first function in part one. Okay, interesting as we look at it, f is defined by just discrete points, just points out there. It's not a graph where it's continuously smooth. It's these discrete located singular points. So remember that domain, the domain of a function is its x values, its inputs. So the domain is, of this function are the x values that are in the following set. And this is not interval notation. Uh, this is very special to the way that this first problem is set up. But the domain is negative 3, negative 1, 0, 2, and 4. Okay, the range of f, oops, the range of f are the y values that are part of this set. And I'm going to try to put these in order. Uh, I see a negative 1. I see a zero, I see two twos, and I see a four. That would be the domain and the range for that function. For the second example, <clears throat> a polynomial uh, like the following one, this is actually a quadratic because its highest degree is two. You can see that right here. This is called a quadratic when the highest degree is two. Um, this is a quadratic that opens downward. You can see its leading coefficient is negative 3. We're going to talk more about that in uh, units to come. But uh, if I were to sketch a graph of this, and I'm going to post a separate video on using your graphing calculator. But if I posted a graph of this function, it would look something like this. Okay, This would be the graph of g of x. Okay, And its domain is going to be all real numbers. So the domain of g... Uh, is x in all real numbers, okay? So <clears throat> x can be any number. 
Um, and, but for y, our range of g is not necessarily all real numbers. You can see that there's a max value right here. Okay, I want to know what this value is. And based on my graphing calculator, it says that the x value that coordinates with that max value is 2 thirds. And the y value for that max value is 6 and 1 third. Okay, so I could say that the range in this case is uh, is um, all values less than or equal to six and one third. Okay, so I could write that in two different ways. Now, here's a good opportunity for me to show you the difference between inequality notation and interval notation. So I'm going to do inequality notation first. Inequality notation would be that g is less than or equal to six and one third. Oops, six and one third and uh, greater than negative infinity. So I'm just gonna write it just like that. G is less than or equal to six and one third. That gives no bound on the lower end. So that's interval notation, excuse me, inequality notation. Interval notation would be that G is greater than negative infinity. Okay, I'm sorry, not greater than. Um, G is an element of the following set, negative infinity up to and including 6 and 1 third. Notice how I close the bracket because it includes 6 and 1 third. That right there would be interval notation. So you see that this is an interval and this is an inequality, but they mean the exact same thing. Okay, uh, move on to part three here. Uh, H of X equals 1 over the quantity X plus 5. Okay, again, I'll, I'll post a video about this as well. But this is uh, a unique function. It's a rational function. And it has an asymptote, a vertical asymptote here at x equals negative 5. So our domain of h is going to be that x cannot equal negative 5. It can take on any other value but not negative 5. Our range for h is going to be all values for h or y, but h cannot equal 0. And what you'd see in the graph uh, is that the function would approach but never reach this value 0. OK? Um, now, that can be written in the other notations. Uh, it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think that I'll save that for another day, okay? But that would be the domain and range. So notice that the domain could be any value except for negative 5, and the range could be any value except for 0. And you only know that, at least right now, based on your skills, based on the graph, so you need to see it. Now, if I look at the volume in the next one, volume of a cube, now this one is somewhat implied, and I'm not looking at a graph. I'm just going to... Uh, the domain of V is going to be S is greater than 0. Now, cube side has to be greater than 0 in order for it to exist. And it can be any value above that. So it could, it could go up to whatever you want it to. And the range uh, for V is that V would also be greater than 0. Okay, not equal to 0. Don't put greater than or equal. Okay, last one. I'm going to quick graph. Uh, m of t, and then talk domain and range. Okay, so here I've got a graph of m of t. Uh, this point right here is the point t equals 4 thirds. So as I look at the domain for m, I see that uh, t is going to be less than or equal to 4 thirds. Okay, the range for m, as you look vertically, okay, it, it looks as if the least value for our range is 0 and our greatest value is unlimited. Okay, so 0 will be our lowest value, therefore m is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, I would, I would typically write m of t greater than or equal to 0 for the range. 
and of course for the domain uh, t is less than four thirds. Now if I wanted to put this into interval notation, I would say that uh, t would be part of the set from negative infinity up to and including four thirds. And the range would be uh, from zero up to infinity. Okay, so that's how I'd write that in interval notation. Uh, these would be inequality notation on the left. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so let's find the domain of the following function and put it in inequality and interval notation. Okay, so what I've done below is I've uh, graphed this, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the first two images in a minute, but I want to focus specifically on the graph here. Um, my graph's window is not square, so it, it doesn't look like a circle, but this is a half circle. Um, so Q of T takes on the form of a half circle. Its domain of Q of T is uh, the values for T. Let's put this in inequality notation first. The values for T range from negative 3 up to and including positive 3. The range of Q of T we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, but this right here is interval notation, excuse me, inequality notation. Let's put it in interval notation. So the domain of Q of T would be uh, T in the set from negative 3 to 3. I tend to err on the side of interval notation, but you can go the other way if you'd like to. So the range of Q of T... We're going to write it in the other two ways in just a second here. Okay, it looks like, based on the graph, that uh, outputs from 0 up to 3. Okay, so I would say uh, that the range of Q of T, so Q of T would be uh, less than or equal to 3 and greater than or equal to 0. And then, of course, Q of T would be part of the set from 0 to 3. That's how we'd write the range in interval notation. Now, I want to show you some of the graphing calculator basics here before I move on to the next slide. So in order to graph this, which at this point is the only way you know how to find the domain and range is to see a graph, um, I press this button right here, Y equals, and then I type in square root 9 minus X squared. And then the window, just from experience, I kind of knew what this was going to look like. You press window, and you can change the x min and x max values. So here you'll see negative 5. That's my x minimum. Here you'll see positive 5. That's my x maximum. And then, of course, y value. For some reason, I, I caught this picture when my cursor was, was blinking and was black. But there's a negative sign behind there. I went from negative 5 in the y to positive 5 in the y. And then y scale and x scale, I just went by 1. Don't worry about resolution or delta x or trace step, any of that stuff. It's not important. That's the basics of graphing, okay? Um, it'll be slightly different uh, with an older model calculator, but I've got a T84 plus, TI84 plus. So hopefully <clears throat> you have one of uh, an updated scale. So let's keep moving. We got a couple. Okay, so this slide here, what I'd like you to do is go off camera use your calculator and graph Q of X. I'm gonna go off camera right now and sketch it real quick. Okay, don't judge me, I did my best. <clears throat> okay, so here's Q of X. And Q of X is an absolute value function. And you've probably done some transformations before. This point here is the point seven comma two. And it's no coincidence that you see a seven here and a two here. <clears throat> And it's upside down, and that's also not a coincidence. It has to do with that negative out front, but we're going to keep that for another lesson. So if I talked about the domain of Q of X, okay, and I'm just going to go with what I'm comfortable with, but I would say X is part of the set of all real numbers, right? There's no limit to what I can plug in. There is a limit to what will come out of it, though, the range. The range of Q of X, right? Q of X will be part of the set from negative infinity up to and including the value two, right? So if I drew a horizontal line, that horizontal, oh, that was a bad idea. Okay, if I were to look at all possible outputs, the max possible output is two. 
There is no min possible output. That's why I have a negative infinity here. And that'd be the domain and range in interval notation. Okay, let's be clear. I put that in interval notation. Uh, nothing would change if I were to do uh, inequality notation. Nothing would change with the domain, but the range would change uh, slightly. Right? I would change the range for q of x to be uh, q of x is less than or equal to 2. That's how you'd write that. So there are different scenarios where one form is favorable over the other, but it's totally on personal preference. All right. Okay, this thing right here is called the difference quotient, and all it really is is slope, and it, it doesn't look like it, and this year you're going to be using it quite a bit in pre-calc, or this semester, whatever you want to call it, but it will be very, very useful later on in calculus. So what I'd like to do first is analyze what we're about to work with. The things we're going to work with are f of x plus h, f of x, and h. So f of x plus h is going to be f of x with x plus h plugged into it. f of x is exactly what it is. And h is kind of a standalone that we're going to leave in the denominator. So let's simplify f of x plus h. <clears throat> f of x plus h is going to be equal to x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 3. Okay, that's f of x plus h. I've got f of x, and I've got h. Let's go ahead and find the difference quotient uh, for f of x equals x squared plus 3. So f of x plus h minus f of x over h is equal to x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 3. That's f of x plus h minus x squared plus 3 all over h. All right, let's reduce. Let's see what we can reduce by combining like terms. x squareds will reduce. 3s will reduce. Therefore, the expression I have left is 2xh plus h squared over h. Now, that actually reduces as well. I can factor out nh. That's 2x plus h over h, which also leaves me with this nice clean expression, 2x plus h. And that is going to come in big in the future as well as next year for you in either AP calculus or G calculus. All right, we got one slide left. We're almost there. Hang with me. All right, so this slide is a bonus slide. This is um, not required in order to get a hundred percent on your exam. It is bonus for those of you who just want a little bit of a challenge. So I'm going to write a function in terms of a related variable. Uh, so for example, part one, write the area of a circle in terms of its diameter. So let's write out the functions that have to do with both of these variables as well as uh, what connects the two. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. What connects the area to the, of the circle to the diameter? Well, the diameter is 2r. Notice that we've got an r in both. So we can tie these two equations together. So the area in terms of r is pi r squared. But what I want is the area in terms of d, its diameter. So we're about to do that. And what we do is we take this expression here, this equation, and I solve for r, r equals d over 2. And what I'm going to do is for r, since those are equivalent, I'm going to substitute d over 2 in for r in the function for the uh, area of a circle. So I'm going to take d over 2, and I'm going to substitute it in for r. And what that will do is that will write the area in terms of d. So let's take the area function, which is pi times r squared, and we're going to plug in d over 2. So the area in terms of d, 
if I simplify, will be d squared pi over 4. Kind of cool. So if you know the diameter of a circle, you don't have to find its area. You can if you want. But uh, this formula would work to find the area in terms of the diameter. Let's look at the second one, and then we'll call it a day. Write the area of a square in terms of its diagonal. Okay, so let's, let's look at that. Here's a square. Here is its diagonal. So here I've got side, here I've got side. For those of you who remember, this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And, and if I have side lengths of S on a 45, 45, 90, then its diagonal length is S root 2. All right, so if the diagonal is equal to S root 2, then S is equal to uh, the diagonal over root 2. So the area of a square, let's talk about that, in terms of the side length is S squared, base times height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this D over square root 2, and I'm going to substitute it. Oops, not there. I'm going to substitute it in right there. And what that will do is that will formulate for me an equation where area is given in terms of its diagonal length. And recognize, though, that these two are not this formula here and this formula here don't have to do with the same shape. So you'll want to designate that this is the area of a square, not the area of a circle. So I could write then that uh, this would be d over square root of 2 quantity squared. Therefore, the area of a square in terms of its diagonal length would be uh, d squared over 2. All right, guys, that's it for uh, this lesson. That was 1b. I uh, hope you have a great day. Let me know if you got any questions.